I'm extremely honored to be here. I wish I were there. I wish this were May. I wish this whole dark summer had not happened and we could have been doing this in person as we had expected to do. Um, but I'm so happy to be able to at least talk to you for a brief time tonight um, using the magics of this technology of Zoom. Um, so as the slide suggests, I think we're at a really urgent moment to think about the strategy we want to embrace for reform. And that strategy, I think, has got to bring us to recognize two incredibly important things. One is how far we have come, and secondly, how far we could go if we get through this dark catastrophe that looks in the uh, next th uh, three months to take us and our attention for a ride. So I wanna start with this, how far we've come. And this is point one. This is a moment of extraordinary optimism for the issues that you and your organization have been fighting for for so many years. Because look how far we have come in such a short period of time. I was shamed to get into this movement by a young man named Aaron Swartz, who came to me in 2007 after I had written many books in the area of internet policy and copyright. And he told me that I needed to give up all of that work and to take up the fight for corruption. Because as he said, and I couldn't deny, none of the issues I was fighting for then had any chance of succeeding so long as we had this deeply corrupted system of government. And he was right. And so on that evening that he came to me to speak about this corruption, I promised him I would take up his fight. And beginning in the next September, I started a project which has been aimed on this question of corruption in particular, as it has focused on our government. And I've written these books and I've given hundreds of talks, including one of my favorite in Seattle in 2011, where I spoke to some of you I know who are in this room. And it was from that talk that we began a conversation which you then took to produce the extraordinary innovation of Seattle's voucher program. I still think the most important innovation in changing the way campaigns have been funded anywhere in the nation, and that's sadly still the case, this is still the most important innovation anywhere. But when this began, when my work in this began, what was striking about this issue is that almost no one got it. I went to a talk in Washington DC, which was the Lib Libertarian Dinner, which was a dinner that was comprised of liberals and libertarians who worked in Washington and who thought about the issues of politics in Washington and how Washington worked. And one of the members of that dinner said to me, I thought science had proven that money didn't matter in Washington. Um, and that view, which when he said it, I recognized many people believed that was true. That view defined policy makers view in Washington and many people in political science. A year later, when I told people I was taking up this project, one of my closest friends who also worked in Washington said, look, people don't give a shit about process. What they care about is substance, whether they're gonna get a higher minimum wage or more social security benefits. But what I saw as I went across the country and spoke about this issue is that I saw people that everywhere they did care about this issue of substance. And over the last 12 years, I've seen a slow growth in the recognition of the importance of this issue because of the work of thousands of people across the country, including the work of your organization. And so as I think about it, I think there's a very simple comparison we can make to see the difference between these two moments. And that's a comparison between the 2016 election and 2020. So as some of you know, in 2016, I tried to do what seemed at the time to be quite a um, dangerous and uh, um, uh, burdensome gamble 
to become a candidate in the Democratic primary because I thought it was critical to make fundamental reform a central issue in that campaign. And so in August of 2015, I launched the campaign Lessig 2016, and I stole your name before it was your name, Fix Democracy First. And what I said in that launch in August of 2015 was that it was critically important that we address this corruption of our democracy, not just through one fundamental change, but through three fundamental changes that our government needed to adopt. And number one was public funding of congressional campaigns. Number two was ending partisan gerrymandering in Congress. And number three was to guarantee an equal freedom to vote for all people, regardless of race and regardless of the ease with which they can get to the polls. And those three together would give us a chance to fix democracy and fix democracy first, because as I said, we needed to do this as the very first thing that we did. And the reason for this was that as I thought, and as I know many of you believe, there is no reason to think about any of the other issues we all care about unless we can find a way to fix democracy first. And so we launched the campaign with many different ads. Here's just one that I did at the time. The system is rigged. 82% of us believe, quote, the system is rigged. Now we can rage about that in anger and fury, or we can fix it first. And when we fix it, then beautiful things, extraordinary things, American things will be possible again. Here's the point that's important about what that campaign was. I wanted a chance to speak, to make this issue central and to make it the issue that the Democrats would talk about at least. Obviously, I didn't run just to be uh, a, a bother. I ran because I thought if in fact we could get elected, it would make it possible to make that happen. But at least it was important to make it an issue in the debate. And so when we launched the campaign, I said I would run if we could raise a million dollars in 30 days, and we did. And obviously, the focus was the chance to get into the debates. And the numbers that we had suggested I would. But when it came to the moment that I qualified for the debates, the Democratic Party shifted the rules. They changed the numbers so that the week uh, that I was qualifying, my campaign manager called me and said, we're gonna be in the debate. And four days later, he called me to say, the numbers have been changed. And they had been changed. They had been written to precisely exclude the qualifying polls that I had had that would make it possible for me to be in the, in the debates. And when that happened, I got an email from someone and said, thus was Larry Mandering born. And Larry Mandering expressed the idea at least, that this issue was not going to be allowed to be a central issue in that election. Okay, now by contrast, think about 2020. 2020 happened after 2019, which 2019 was triggered importantly by something that happened in 2018. Because in 2018, a key event in the history of our reform movement occurred. This woman, Nancy Pelosi, made a promise. She said, I promise that if our party takes control of Congress, then the first issue I will take up is fundamental reform of our campaigns. And in 2019, she delivered on that promise. HR1, which was passed in the first seven months of uh, 2019, is the most important democracy reform package that has been passed by uh, the House or by Congress since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And HR1 embodied three critical principles. Number one, public funding of congressional campaigns. Number two, 
the end of partisan gerrymandering, and number three, the restoration of the Voting Rights Act to guarantee equal freedom to vote and many other changes as well. Now, HR1 has become the floor on how we think about what should happen for democracy reform in the next administration. And because of the work of groups like Represent Us and End Citizens United and Equal Citizens, the group that I now run, we were able to get every major Democratic candidate in the 2020 primary and Bill Weld in the Republican primary to agree that in the first 100 days, they would commit to passing HR 1-like legislation to fix democracy first. HR 1 or better within the first 100 days. Now, the idea that every major, major Democratic candidate would do that in, 19, in 2016 was literally unbelievable. But the reality was, in 2020, that's what they had done. And that change is because tens of thousands of people across this country have finally made it clear to our politicians that this fundamental reform we demand, and they are finally hearing us and doing something in response. That's how far we've come, but let's think a little bit about where we've got to go. This is point two. We've entered this new age from where at least I was 12 years ago, an age where there are democracy reformers everywhere. We see major studies produced by serious organizations like the Bergeron Foundation or the American Academy or summarized um, in this report at Vox, reports that are offering 11 different solutions to fixing our democratic problem. Indeed, every one of these packages includes scores of reforms that this corrupted and broken democracy needs. And there's no doubt that they are right about the reform we need. But here's the problem. This approach, this strategy of kind of kitchen sink reform is kind of like how rich people renovate or gut renovate homes. What they do is they bring in the architects and the contractors and they ask them, what do we need? And then the architecture, architects and the contractors tell them. And then they order up all of the changes that they think they need. And of course, if you can afford that, that's fine. But the problem here for democratic reform is not about whether we can afford these changes. Obviously, we can. The problem here is the strategic problem of aiming for 40 or 50 changes at once. It's not just that it's wrong, it's that it is self-defeating. Because the difference between democratic reform and fixing an old house is that old houses don't defend their flaws. They don't resist reform. They don't rally with all the money in the world to protect themselves from reform. But DC will. Washington DC will fight back against the reform that our movement has been pushing. And so our strategy must be to take them out first, to take out those who could leverage their wealth to produce the resistance that this package of reform is inevitably, inevitably going to see. And so in my view, that strategy must be this, to fix democracy first, we have to fix the money problem first. And not in a small way, but in a big way. So for example, HR1 critically has a public funding component right at the center of its bill. And that public funding component has two very different strategies. The one strategy, the most important, is a matching fund strategy that says small dollar contributions can be matched six to one if candidates agree to limit their contributions in certain ways. But the second part of the funding solution is the pilot for a Seattle-like voucher program. Three states will be given the chance to opt into a program 
where citizens can get $25 if they are a registered voter in a voucher, if they ask for that voucher. Now, my view is the combination here is great. It's wonderful to see public financing of elections at the core of a major reform package. But my view is this is not enough if we're going to change the economy of influence that has now captured Washington. Six times matching from essentially already the sort of people who can afford to give to campaigns rich people is not enough. And we need to follow much more aggressively the lead that has been staked out by Democratic candidates in the primary like Andrew Yang or Kirsten Gillibrand, or finally even Bernie Sanders, who so passionately argued that the only way we will fundamentally change the influence in Washington and the economy of influence that makes it so that real change never happens is if we give every single voter the easy opportunity to contribute into political campaigns. Indeed, Kirsten Gillibrand's proposal was for $200 for every federal race, which means that in some election cycles, citizens in certain districts could get up to $600 in democ democracy dollars. Now, the point is, this is an extraordinary opportunity for us when the Democratic Party has not just committed to public funding, but committed to a kind of public funding that could radically change the influence in Washington. And I think what we need to be pushing for now is a massive test of vouchers in this country, at least a test. So not three states, but imagine 200 congressional districts, 100 Republican and 100 Democrat, where a adequate voucher, more than $25 is sent to every single voter, not given a chance for voters to request. And when we run that experiment and demonstrate its effect, it will give us a chance so that we can show clearly what it would mean to have representatives as Madison promised us would, uh, we would have working in a branch of the government that ought to be dependent on the people alone. And by the people, Madison said in Federalist 52, he meant, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Because my fear is this is how they will kill our movement. I'm sure many of you are, admi admire this extraordinary writer and journalist, Ezra Klein, and I do too. And I'm especially enamored of his most recent book, Why We Are All Polarized. It's a terrifying account of where we are in American politics. But Ezra is a skeptic about small dollar donors. In his view, systems that encourage small dollar donors are systems that encourage even more polarization of us. Now, I've looked at the data, and I don't believe that's actually true about small dollar donors. I don't think that small dollar matching fund donors have that effect or would have that effect if, in fact, this were the primary way we were funding campaigns. But the point is not whether it's true. The point is whether it's a credible argument that can be used by those who don't want change against us. And this is the opportunity for vouchers in contrast to matching fund programs. Because if what Ezra says is true, if it is true that small dollar donors are having a polarizing effect, because those willing to give money to a political campaign are those deeply invested in the issues and they tend to be people on the either far right or far left. If that's true, it's especially true with matching fund systems, much more than it would be true in voucher systems. Because voucher systems not only would enable people at the partisan extremes to contribute large amounts of money, it would also encourage those in the middle, the many, many times the number of people in the middle who would be empowered to give money and encouraged to give money by candidates 
who are trying to appeal to them. The point is right now, candidates are appealing where the money is. And the money is where people are willing to give it. And the people willing to give it now are typically people at the extremes of the political spectrum. But if the money were also in the place of the middle, then those people too would become an important target of the candidates running for office and many candidates could prosper aiming at that middle rather than the extremes. So my point here is that to resist this resistance and not in a resistance by the evil uh, corporate overlords, but a resistance even by those who are close to us in values and ideals. We need vouchers to be part of this package too. Indeed, I think we need it mainly as a part of the way we fund campaigns publicly and maybe even exclusively. And here's where there's an extraordinarily important role for you. Because obviously you and your organization, even in its earlier incarnation, have been at the center of democracy reform in this part, uh, in your part of the country for as long as I've been in this business and longer. And you've made money in politics a central part of the reform you have helped to enable to get passed. And you've done the work in Seattle around uh, uh, vouchers to enable that as a liberating force. And I now know you're pushing hard to remove the corrupting influence of foreign money, which was successfully done in Seattle, and also limiting the influence of large contributions and super PACs as well. But the point is, those arguments about super PACs and foreign money are arguments everyone in some sense is equally expert in. You have a special expertise in teaching us, teaching all of America, how the dynamic of vouchers can make things different. Not perfect, not utopia, not a system where money doesn't speak, but a system where money speaks through the voices of the tens of thousands of people who would participate, as opposed to the tiny few who participate in a world where private money exclusively is used to fund campaigns. You could teach us what reform could be before these anti-reformers turn fear and fear of even things we should fear like the polarization of this nation against the ideals of reform. Okay, when I make this argument, about the essential place that fixing the money problem has got to have in any strategy of reform, and that we must insist on it as being the number one change that we make. People rightly ask, well, what about voting rights? Shouldn't voting rights be first or be within the package that gets passed first? And my view is absolutely yes. In the first round, we have to restore the protection that existed to assure that those who wanted to vote could vote, especially to protect the excluded voters who the systems of exclusion that have been adopted by states uh, primarily in the South across this country have wrongfully denied the opportunity to participate, primarily people of color in states controlled primarily by white Republicans. But we need to recognize that more people choose not to vote than are prevented from voting. And they choose not to vote because it doesn't make sense to them. And it doesn't make sense either because they recognize who calls the shots in Washington, or they live in districts where they see that what they believe is not gonna change anything and who gets elected. So the political system tells them they don't matter and they respond by saying, so I won't participate. And that's why I believe it's essential, as important as assuring that everybody who wants to vote can vote, is assuring that everybody feels that there's a reason for them to vote. And they will feel that only if they see a system 
where politicians are focused on what people care about and not what the funders demand. They don't participate now because it doesn't make sense because it's driven by campaign dollars. We must change that first. If we're going to bring the extraordinary number of people who've checked out of this political system back in. Okay, I want to make two more points before I stop and I'm eager and happy to take your questions. Just about a year after Aaron Swartz convinced me to take up this fight, Barack Obama gave an extraordinary speech to the AFL-CIO in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And here's what Barack said. He called on those union members to join him to, quote, take up that fight. As he said, if we're not willing to take up that fight, the fight to change the way Washington works, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Take up that fight. Now, I believe Barack Obama was a great president. He was a friend before he became president, and I can't begin to estimate the admiration that I feel for him and that I know many Americans feel for him. But the truth is he never took up that fight. Indeed, after he beat Hillary Clinton in the primary, this way of talking disappeared from his campaign. After he beat Hillary Clinton, it was no longer a campaign about changing the way Washington works. It was a campaign focused on the things he thought he could accomplish, healthcare being one, but climate change legislation and a whole host of other reforms that he believed simply by being good, he could get past. But the truth is what Barack Obama said almost 11 years ago was true then and it is true now. If we don't take up this fight, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked as it was blocked in the Barack Obama administration, it will be blocked again by the defenders of the status quo. This is the promise we have to finally deliver on. Now, this idea that we could deliver on such a promise is so hard to see right now. It is so hard to see how close we are to succeeding here because we stand right now at a chasm and look into this chasm, deep into this chasm and just see the catastrophe that is before us. There are so many movies where they come to the edge of the chasm and they can't draw their eyes away from the terrors that are right below them and the fear that they're about to fall and all that will happen if they fall. But in every one of those movies, the lesson is to look beyond the chasm. The lesson is to look over the chasm to what is on the other side. And we must look beyond as well. Because if we can get through the challenges of the next 40 days, and then the challenges of the next 60 days after that to finally determine who will be the next president. And if we can get through it with a candidate who has committed, as Joe Biden has, to this fundamental reform in the first 100 days, if, and I realize this is a big if, given the extraordinarily fragile system we have for electing a president, a system that presumes good faith on both sides, which is not a presumption one can easily make in this election cycle. But if we can get beyond the chasm and imagine what it will be like on the other side, then for the first time in two generations, there is a chance, a chance for real change here, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans. And so as hard as we must all work to elect a candidate and a Congress who has committed to making this change happen, 
we need to sell the optimism of the possibility of a democracy where this is our nature, at least if never, if not again, for the first time. A nature of a representative democracy that truly represents its citizens, not the tiny fraction who have enormous power and leverage that power to their benefit. Your success is an extraordinary lesson to all of America. And you can help us, you can help us make this success happen by helping people imagine what a better democracy can be and helping them see that real change happens when people gather together and demand it and the politicians finally follow what the people demand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. That was great. Um, we have quite a few questions that we want to um, begin to start asking. We got lots of questions. So one of the first ones that came up was, didn't or don't at least some senators and reps want to see the money problem fixed so they don't need to spend so much time raising funds? Does it really all come from response to people? And is it really all elected officials resisting this sort of reform? Well, obviously, we've seen real reformers uh, in leaders like John Sarbanes uh, working so hard to get Nancy Pelosi to finally take up this challenge. So yes, I don't think this is just something that um, people on the outside want to see happen. Um, and many members in Congress recognize that the job they have, the job they are leading, is a job that is, in fact, nothing like what they thought they would be doing because they never imagined that they would be spending their life uh, uh, raising money um, to get back into office or to help their party get back into office. Like they spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money. Not a single person who went to Washington as a congressperson went there because they thought this would be a great job. I'd love to spend 30 to 70 percent of my time raising money, because if that's what they thought, that's what they wanted. That's the job they were looking for. They would have gotten a job at like a university where they could have been paid real money for raising that kind of money. But the point is, they don't like it either. But they're not strong enough, many of them, to risk changing a system that brought them there. They know how to win in this system. And many of them are fearful that they won't be able to win in a new system, or they're fearful that a new system will encourage too many competitors, too many people who will challenge them. Um, and that's the hard job of persuasion. And as much as I admire Nancy Pelosi, the real hero here is John Sarbanes, who has made it his, his, his job not just to craft the legislation, but to spend endless time talking to members of Congress to get them to see, to imagine how they could run their campaigns differently, how they could actually still be successful while running their campaigns, raising money from small contributors. So I think many of them are there. And if we could, if we could uh, get the push and the leadership, we could get it through. And the reality is, if Nancy Pelosi is speaker in 2021 and Mitch McConnell the dark lord of DC has been returned to Kentucky and, and Joe Biden is president. I'm absolutely certain Nancy Pelosi will pass this bill again. And then it will be Chuck Schumer's job to get it past the Senate. And he is committed to doing that as well. But already every Democrat in Congress has committed to passing it. They voted for it in 2019. And those that come are, are coming to Congress are even more committed to reform. So I think you're gonna see this agreement, at least among Democrats, and my hope is we can get at least 10% of Republicans to join them so it doesn't seem deeply partisan the way, unfortunately, too many of these issues are. Thank you for that. Um, we have an, a question from Libby. Um, we mentioned earlier that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died today. In your view, what likely, what's likely to happen in the near future with this sad event? So it is, it is an extraordinarily disruptive event in the middle of this campaign. And it's disruptive because, um, first of all, you know, after 
refusing to take up President Obama's nominee when, uh, when uh, Justice Scalia died in February of uh, um, 2016. Because as Mitch McConnell put it, when a candidate, when a justice dies in an election year, we should wait for the people to give their views before considering a nominee by the president. Mitch McConnell has after that said that if a candidate died before the election in 2020, he, if a justice died, he would certainly bring a justice through the Senate and confirm that justice. So it is the most blatant partisan hypocrisy you could imagine. And it is likely, given the way the Senate functions and the three person, effectively four with Mike Pence as the tiebreaker majority that he has, it's, it's likely he'll be able to do that. Okay, so if he does that, that's gonna infuriate Democrats and um, that's gonna drive up um, um, attention to the race and that might actually help defeat Donald Trump. If he doesn't do that, which of course is something I don't think he should do given what he did with uh, Justice Scalia's death. If he doesn't do that, it's likely to drive up the participation of pro-Trump supporters in this election. Because there'll be many people who say on the right, I don't like Donald Trump, but I don't want a liberal appointed to the Supreme Court. So I wanna guarantee that there's a conservative who's gonna replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, and then Justice Breyer likely, and certainly Phil Justice Thomas's seat. Those are two people who um, could easily step down in the next four years. And so you could see a surge in conservative participation because she has died when she has died. If Mitch McConnell does what many of us hope he does, which is not to bring a new justice through on the court. So in a certain sense, um, we lose either way. We either lose the seat um, and, uh, um, uh, or we lose because there's so much more attention and, uh, driven to the race. And so I think it's, um, we're gonna see a spin of this in, in an extraordinary way. And we're gonna see a lot that's focused, unfortunately on the question of the Supreme Court, rather than what I think it should be focused on, which is um, the qualifications of uh, this president and, uh, and uh, Joe Biden who's trying to replace him. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions around the vouchers. Does the voucher system propose um, also or uh, incorporate any limits on campaign spending uh, by social welfare and the wealthy and outside spending and also about changing lobbyists and super PACs and private money? There's two different questions, but both on the same um, theme. So how would, how would, we know how they work in Seattle, but what are you envis envisioning for these vouchers maybe going further? Well, the vouchers um, can qualify the amount of money that is raised by a candidate. In principle, it could also qualify the amount, amount of money that a candidate spends. So it could say, if you want to receive vouchers, you must agree to only take contributions of $500. Or if you want to receive vouchers, you have to agree not to spend more than X million dollars on your race. So it's possible to do that because as the Supreme Court held in Buckley versus Vallejo, the Congress has the power to condition the receipt of public funding on conditions like limiting your spending or limiting contributions you might take. But as long as the Supreme Court recognizes um, Citizens United or recognizes or allows the decision in the lower court called Speech Now, which established super PACs to, uh, to survive, then it's not the case that that bill has the power to limit outside spending or outside uh, organizations like super PACs. The Supreme Court has effectively allowed the First Amendment to be seen as protecting those activities, even though my own view is that um, uh, there's a significant chance that at least with super PACs, the Supreme Court would see the question a different way, but that's not what that bill would address. Since we're speaking about super PACs and the speechnow.org decision, I know Ken Damon, our vice chair, had a question earlier about free speech for people's approach to trying to limit independent expenditures and ch as a challenge to that lower court decision. How, how do you view that strategy? Well, my view is we should try everything we can. So um, I'm a big admirer of free speech uh, for people and, and the work they've done, and, and they've certainly 
uh, assembled an extraordinary group of um, scholars and lawyers to support the appeal. Of course, the Supreme Court has to take the cert. It's uh, now before the Supreme Court. They have to decide whether to take the case. Um, but it's a chance. Um, we actually have a case that's uh, trying a different strategy um, uh, through Alaska. So Alaska has this very interesting law that says that if the Alaska Election Commission is not enforcing its uh, election law, a citizen's allowed to complain about it. So we found a bunch of citizens in Alaska who were upset that the Alaska Super PAC law was not being enforced. So we went to the, um, so those citizens filed a complaint and the citizens elect, the election commission said, we can't enforce the super PAC law because super PACs are constitutionally protected by speech now. And so what we said was um, in the appeal of that decision to the district court, we said, actually speech now doesn't bind Alaska. It's a lower federal court. It's not the Supreme Court. And if you actually tried to figure out whether the Supreme Court would uphold speech now, you've got to answer the question, how would the conservative justices, those who believe in originalism, respond to the idea of something like a super PAC? And we said, we believe that an originalist who was informed by the original understanding of our framers to the Constitution, an originalist would not allow uh, 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 super PACs to be unregulated because of the First Amendment. So we said, let us prove that to you. And the district court judge said, okay. And we brought uh, Jack Rakoff, who is the number one historian on the original understanding of the framers about critical aspects of our constitution. We brought him to Alaska and he testified for two hours explaining the original understanding. And the argument was that uh, at least one or two of those conservative justices would not strike down regulations of super PACs because it would be inconsistent with the original understanding of corruption and the kind of corruption that the framers would be regulating. The district court judge uh, granted our motion. They uh, held that we were correct. And now we're on appeal to the Alaska Supreme Court. And in the Alaska Supreme Court, we're going to make the same argument. And then out of the Alaska Supreme Court, we're going to go to the United States Supreme Court and we're going to make an argument focused exclusively on the originalists. Now, when we were doing this before, we were assuming four justices who had clearly expressed their view that super PACs could be regulated. Um, um, obviously, now there's only three. Um, but we're still going to claim that the judges, um, uh, that the originalists should consider whether originalism actually allows uh, uh, the courts to block legislatures from regulating super PACs, and we don't think it does. So these are two very different strategies. The free speech strategy is aiming at the liberal wing of the court, and our strategy is aiming at the conservative wing of the court. And the reality is right now there's five justices on the conservative wing and three justices on the uh, liberal wing, and so um, um, I want both, both uh, both strategies to have their shot. Yes, we're working with free speech in Seattle on that, um, that limits on independent expenditures. We still haven't passed that piece, but we're working on that. We have a question in the chat from Ellie about vouchers. And she said, not to be a skeptic, but would folks in the middle be willing to sell uh, or sell for money their vouchers instead of doing the work to educate themselves? How do you set up a voucher program that is protected for all users? I don't think it's, I know Seattle vouchers, it's illegal to sell your yeah. vouchers. Yeah, so it's a really important point and a problem to, to architect around. Uh, and so the first thing you do is you just say it's illegal. Um, and most people in fact don't think that's quite enough. So there's a really clever solution that's been proposed by um, Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers to this problem. And the basic solution is, you make it so that um, any gift you give to a candidate can be, any donation you make to a candidate can be revoked after 24 hours. So if I say, here's my voucher to you, the candidate, or my voucher number, I give it to you and you credit $25 from my voucher account to your campaign, I have the ability tomorrow to take back that $25. Okay, now the reason you do this is that um, you make it really easy for people to um, uh, uh, take back their money, which means that those 
people who are likely to want to break the law are also people who are likely to want to take back their money and try to sell it again. So the point is that when you say to somebody right now, um, I'm going to sell you uh, my voucher, the, uh, the, the contribution, the selling of the voucher is not stable because it can be reclaimed at any time. It's similar to, you know, think about voting. Before there was secret voting, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, before there was secret voting, there were many people who sold their votes. And when they sold their votes, um, it was easy to verify that they had sold their votes because somebody would sit in the room and I said I would vote for Smith. And if I don't raise my hand when Smith is called, then I didn't, sell, I didn't obey the contract. So if I didn't obey the contract, I wouldn't be paid. And so after votes were secret, it's not that people couldn't sell their votes. It's just that if you sold your votes, um, uh, there was no way to verify that the vote you voted the way you promised. And so if there's no way to verify, the value of your vote for sale falls dramatically. Before, when it was transparent, you knew perfectly well how I was going to vote. Afterwards, you've got to trust me. Well, if I'm the sort of person who's going to sell my vote, I'm not the sort of person you should trust. And that's the same dynamic with the vouchers. If you get, can give the voucher, but then call it back, then the person who's giving the voucher illegally is likely to be the sort of person who's going to call it back. And if they call it back, then they can sell it again. So there's no reason to try to buy it in the first place. And that's uh, an important dynamic to reduce the incentive to engage in this illegal activity. And that plus the fact that it should be absolutely criminally punished if you do sell your voucher, I think would reduce the problem uh, quite, uh, quite effectively. Next question is from Daniel. The primary system to be to, seems to be at fault for polarization. The extreme ends of the spectrum have to have um, too much power in primaries. Uh, would getting rid of primaries and vouchers be even better? So there's a great push by many really smart people to think about changing primaries um, and um, and to eliminate primaries. And you know this is an example of good idea that had unintended consequences because the purpose of primaries was to take power away from the political bosses um, because the political bosses was thought were selling the power of political parties to the highest bidder, namely um, the corrupt um, business interests that were trying to control politics. So same as it ever was. Um, but they thought if they had primaries, then the people could control it. And that made sense so long as everybody was voting. But just as only people at the extremes are willing to give money, only people at the extremes are willing to take the time in a primary to go out and vote. So it's, it's true that you see a significant uh, pull to each side because of the dynamic of the primary. Now, one way to, to deal with that is to, um, is to eliminate primaries, but then the question is, what's the alternative? Another way is to try to make it easier for people to participate or to bring more people into the election process so that not just the extremes are participating. And one dynamic that might help do that is ranked choice voting. Because if ranked choice voting were there, then even if you wanted to favor your extremist uh, person, you would also be uh, giving your second and third choice votes to other people. And as the extremes were not rewarded, the people in the middle um, could have an opportunity to rise. Um, so rather than imagining jumping away from primaries into I don't know what, um, I think we should experiment with adding ranked choice into the political process. Now, you know, we worked very hard to try to get ranked choice in New Hampshire, for example. Um, and indeed, Equal Citizens uh, made an offer to the New Hampshire um, uh, Secretary of State that we would raise the money to fund running a new uh, uh, ranked choice voting primary in New Hampshire. And that we said to them, as long as you used a ranked choice ballot, you could announce the results in the same way you always did on the night of the election and just give us the copies of the ballots at that point and give us 12 hours and we'll come back with the ranked choice results. The Secretary of State um, was, is an extremely conservative um, uh, Secretary of State. He was not willing to experiment or add this um, into the mix. Um, and so unfortunately, you know, we had this whole Democratic primary where um, there were so many interesting candidates with interesting views who quickly were just pushed aside because there was no way for the aggregation through ranked choice voting to actually reflect the um, kind of confidence that the 
party as a whole might have in any one candidate. So I want to see that change first. And if that change doesn't do enough, plus ending the corrupting influence of uh, money, then, then we'll have to try to see what else we need. The next question is connected to ranked choice voting. So I'm going to skip ahead to this one. Um, this is from Ryan Jones, Jonesy. Hey, Jonesy. You have written about how ranked choice voting and um, you've written about ranked choice voting in presidential elections like Maine will practice this year um, is a way to provide that elected candidate supported by the majority of voters. We, we are definitely advocates of ranked choice voting at Fixed Democracy First. The popular um, vote interstate compact is a plan to elect the president by a result of the national popular vote. What is the best way to reconcile these two reforms so that they work together? Really hard problem. Um, I've just, in fact, um, spent an hour and a half today uh, studying and then on the phone with lawyers from the uh, Fair Vote uh, project to talk about exactly ideas to make this reconciliation work. Because the challenge we have with electing a president in the United States is that we don't have a national election. We have an election run by 51 separate jurisdictions. And those separate jurisdictions have their own rules and they have their own systems and they have their own ballots. Um, and so, whereas it's conceivable, it's, it's, it's understandable how you run ranked choice when there's one central entity that's counting and ranking the ballots, when you've got 51 separate jurisdictions, it's really hard to imagine how you could aggregate. So one idea, the simplest idea, if it were constitutional, but I don't think it's constitutional, but the simplest idea is if the ranked choice, if a national popular vote gets its 270 uh, uh, threshold and is going to be in place. Congress could, uh, if, you know, the idea would be Congress would pass a law that mandates that states adopt a consistent ranked choice ballot that would enable um, ranked choice to be uh, calculated even though you had 51 separate jurisdictions that were running the races. Um, and you could have this done either at the national level or at least for those states that were um, participating in the um, national, in the, um, in the compact. So you wouldn't necessarily have to force a state that was not in the compact to cooperate, but you could have states in the compact cooperating. The alternative is just to have a compact like the compact among states that would give them um, the incentive or uh, the agreement to adopt a, a, a similar ballot that would enable the calculation of the ranked choice by, um, by the, those, within the, those within the states. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a really important challenge. I think we need to solve this problem because I think one of the problems with, uh, um, with the compact is that it doesn't guarantee that we get a majority president. I think it's a really important problem when democracies build systems that allow plurality people to take control as if they are speaking for the majority. Obviously, we have that right now. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Donald Trump not only um, didn't win the majority, didn't even win the plurality, but he's president of the United States. But Bill Clinton didn't win the majority. He just won a plurality. And I think that that, set, that seeded lots of resistance that made it hard um, to, for him to claim a kind of authority that I think the president needs to claim. So the objective of ranked choice, which is to find a way to get us to a candidate that actually does have the support of the majority of the people, is an incredibly important objective in the context of the president. And if you do national popular vote, it's hard. There's an alternative solution, which um, uh, equal votes has been, e equal, equal citizens has been involved in developing. And we're about to launch um, a deliberative poll, a kind of virtual deliberative poll that we will be inviting thousands of people to participate in. You guys will be on the top of the list of people we asked to participate in it. And what this poll is trying to understand is whether there's another solution that could get, you know, be 99% of uh, what a national popular vote would be, where you allocated, um, uh, if you allocated electors in a um, proportional way, electoral votes in a proportional way at a fractional level. And if you did that, then within each state, you could have ranked choice as the way to figure out what candidates, what votes candidates have so that they they got the proper fraction at the, at the fractional level. Um, and you would make every state relevant because every vote, regardless of where you got it, would be worth something to a presidential campaign. So they'd be just as eager to campaign in Montana as they would be to campaign 
in Pennsylvania. Um, the challenge to that, of course, though, is that that requires constitutional amendment, which is the genius behind the National Popular Vote Compact. Um, and so my hope is we find a way to see the compact work. Uh, and if we do, then we need urgently to find a way to add ranked choice into that. Thank you for that one. Um, we have a question from Tina. How do we convince those to vote who don't feel like their vote matters, especially if they live in a place that's heavily gerrymandered in the favor of um, right-leaning politicians? We know the red map, we've been showing Slay the Dragon, which illustrates how the pro red map project. So how do we get people that want to vote in this kind of scenario? You know, I find it's easier to convince people of something that's, tr of, that's true rather than something that's not true. And because I believe that, I think it's hard to convince them that it's worthwhile for them to vote. One, it's not worthwhile for them to vote. And that means that I think what we need to do is to make it worthwhile for them to vote. And that means pushing these reform proposals so that we change this systematic inequality in our system. I know you've been kind enough to talk about and make available my book, uh, They Don't Represent Us, but this is the core part of the arguments in the first half of the book, that we've built a democracy that along uh, five different dimensions is an unrepresentative, representative democracy. The way we fund campaigns makes some people radically more powerful than other people in a representative democracy. The way we gerrymander makes some people more powerful than other people because of the lines the state has drawn, because of the electoral college. Swing states have power, non-swing states don't. Because of the Senate, Small states have power that big states don't. Because of the extraordinary suppression of the vote, motivated by political reasons, but manifested in racial terms because of the division of the parties, we have unequal freedom to vote. So these inequalities in voting are real. And it's completely rational for many people to understand that in fact, their vote just doesn't matter. And, um, and though I would say to them, you know, take the heroic step and participate anyway, I would say the more important thing to do is to take the efforts that you have been leading and that other people across the country have been leading to try to build the movement to make the reform happen. And again, there's a real chance, you know, maybe it's just 10%, maybe it's 20%, but it's a hundred times what it was four years ago, that in a year, we will have these fundamental reforms. There's a real chance we'll have fundamental change in the way we fund campaigns, gerrymandering reform, the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, automatic vote registration. Um, and, and so there's a real chance we get to the place where we can turn around to them and say, yes, you were right. The system you, we had gave you no reason to participate at all, but the system has changed. And now that it's changed, you need to step up and make sure it reflects your views just as it reflects the views of people across the street. Um, we have a, a question, Ashley, from Carol, which I can answer real quick because she's not in Seattle and was wondering how the vouchers work in Seattle. Basically, every eligible uh, resident of Seattle, which includes um, uh, green card holders, receive four $25 vouchers that can be given to any qualifying candidate of their choice running for city council, city attorney, or mayor. And, um, it, and they have odd year elections. So this coming year, they'll be electing at large and the mayor next year. So I just wanted to answer that one real quick. Next question from Julianne. Four years seems like a sh such a short time for an established democracy could how for an established democracy to crumble. Are we really facing such a possibility or have we lost perspective on that? Being too close to the chasm, as you say. Well, I mean, I think that in fact, many institutions have uh, withstood the pressure of this administration quite amazingly. Um, you know, the Justice Department has a attorney general at the head, which is truly an embarrassment to the practice of law. But there are many people in the Justice Department who have been brave souls, who have continued to do the work in a way that's not been controlled by this partisan president. Um, and, and I think that you see instances of that throughout the government. But I do believe that if America 
in response to this extraordinarily bad norm breaching behavior says four more years, all bets are off in my view about what happens to America. You know, we think it can't happen here. They didn't think it could happen in Germany either, right? They don't, they don't, you never think it can happen because the slow steps towards this collapse are almost imperceptible except to people who step back and notice the dynamic of history and how it maps onto the dynamic that's happening here. Um, I think that there are critical norms of our government that this president has violated that no president before had ever even thought to violate. So the norm that would say that you can just fire inspector generals who um, are discovering things you don't like is a complete violation of the norm of independence rule of law inside of a government. And yet this president believes he can do that. The idea that you um, would leverage your personal financial interests so that the government benefits you. I mean, you know, it's a small deal, but the idea that the president of the United States blocks the FBI from moving from Washington to Virginia because their office building is across the street from the Trump Hotel, and many people stay at the Trump Hotel who have business with the FBI, is literally incomprehensible. I can't imagine a single president in American history who would have thought like that, though maybe Nixon, because certainly Nixon took bribes in a way that benefited not just his campaign, but him personally. So it's not like it's inconceivable, but the kind of in plain sight uh, corruption is, is literally um, un unprecedented. And if it is not punished, if there's no consequence for it, then I think uh, a certain idea of rule of law America has been lost. I, I don't think we can say anything other than that. And when that happens, I don't know what happens. You know, um, people are focused, I think, on the energy that people on the right have to make sure that the president is reelected. But I think that many people need to think about the energy on the other side that is going to be unleashed if there's an election that is deemed to be um, fraudulent or coerced or illegitimate or in some way improperly reelecting uh, this president. If 7% of America goes to the streets because George Floyd is murdered, what percent of America is going to go to the streets if they believe their election has been stolen? And so I think that the, the destabilization has got to at some point hit even those who might like the president and get them to realize that this has got to be a clean election. And the games that are being set up right now cannot happen because if they do, I, I genuinely fear the consequences um, uh, for the Republic in the, in the days between November 3rd and January 20th. Um, we have a correct question from Cindy Madigan. I agree with what you said about Obama's presidency, and I saw that in a couple of um, uh, notes in here. What makes you believe Joe Biden will take up this necessary action to make a better democracy? How will he follow what people demand? You know, there are two reasons to be extremely hopeful about Joe Biden. Number one is young Joe Biden. So if you go back to 1973, when uh, first term Senator Joe Biden is testifying about campaign finance. Joe Biden is affirmatively and strongly arguing in 1973 for total public funding of uh, congressional campaigns. He, you know, he, he might be willing to compromise with some private funding, but he wants total public funding. And the arguments he gives for it are the arguments that all of you have given and that I have given and everybody has given, that members, are constantly forced to choose between the interest of their funders and the interests of their constituents. And that's not a choice that we should be making those members make, allowing those members to make. So I know it's in his bones and been in his bones from the very beginning. That's number one. Number two, though nobody would say this, Joe Biden is not gonna run for reelection. Joe Biden is gonna be a president who tries to do a term that sets himself for history. And just like Nancy Pelosi has recognized that this reform 
would be the most important thing she could do as speaker. So too, I think, will Joe Biden recognize that this reform would radically change the way American politics now functions for the good, and that he would be remembered as the person who made that possible. Um, I think Obama was maybe rightly told that if he took a gamble and tried to get this passed, it would be too dangerous for the reelection of Obama. Um, and so that shifted away from being his focus. And so it just was nothing he ever did. But I think there's a chance. No, I don't think it's guaranteed. I mean, obviously, Biden didn't make it the fundamental issue he talked about during the campaign. But the other thing this, that makes me optimistic is not Joe Biden, it's Nancy Pelosi. I'm absolutely certain she's going to pass that bill again. And that bill is going to include public funding. And what the Senate does is up to us. And what the president does, um, I think, is pretty clear. If the Democratic Congress passes this bill, he's going to sign it. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that I have. You held up uh, the cover of Our Common Purpose by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that was reinventing American democracy for the 21st century. Um, they have a short timeline, six years for our 250th anniversary, which I was really excited to see that it wasn't like over a decade or two, but it was a short term. In public or uh, civic engagement and, and was a big piece of that. One of the programs we're working on is developing a youth outreach for middle schoolers called YoVote. How do you see youth engagement as a, an important piece to um, fixing democracy? I think it's critical, but again, I think it's possible only if there's a reason to believe engaging with government uh, uh, has a reason, has a purpose. If you don't see there's any reason, if you see that the shots are being called by the funders, you won't step in. So that's again the point that, I, you know, the criticism I would make of these, these, these packages, these kitchen sink reform proposals. If it's not clear that number one on that list has got to be to de, uh, disempower the special interest money, then nothing else that follows is gonna be possible. But if you do that first, if you disempower that money, then you open up a space where other reforms become easier, become more feasible. And once you have elected a bunch of people who come to Washington with the right money for the right reason, aiming for the perfection of this democracy, then a bunch of them can happen almost overnight because there's nobody left to resist them. But if you don't focus the critical strategic point, I fear we lose the opportunity for this reform, especially because the people pushing against reform are the very best lobbyists in Washington because they are the lobbyists. That's exactly their job. And if they, if they are keen on one thing, it is preserving a system that gives them enormous wealth because of the enormous power that it allocates to them as the middlemen in this, in this process. So again, the Vox article is like classic. The Vox article that I showed you that goes on for, you know, it's extraordinarily comprehensive for an article. That's the great thing about Vox. But public funding is number 10 on a list of 11. Number 10. And, and you're like, if you are not going to get till 10 before you get to public funding, you're not going to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine either. So we've got to raise this awareness. And you guys are so well situated to do that because you've succeed, you're in a context where this has been a success. And it's, I can tell you everywhere in the country, people look and are eager for the data about what's happening in the Seattle experiment, because I think most people see that this is, this is a real opportunity for the federal level too. We're gonna to stay on money and politics. How does a 28th amendment fit into the picture to end corporate uh, corruption of big money? And how likely it is that to happen? I know we passed an initiative here in Washington in 2016, calling for that to overturn decisions like Citizens United? Well, I am a supporter of an amendment. Um, I'm also uh, skeptical that there are 30, uh, there are three fourths of the states that will pass it when the money that would support the current system is deployed to stop it from succeeding. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is when framed as an attack on Citizens United, um, it actually divides many communities. I mean, there are many liberal, um, you know, free speech activists who are skeptical of the movement to overturn Citizens United. 
because as much as they don't like big money, they don't like the idea of the government controlling or having the power to control how much anybody can spend. Um, now, I think that there's ways to craft that power so that it's not abused by government. But whether or not you can limit how much a government you can spend, what I think is we have a chance to get the Supreme Court to acknowledge that you can limit the amount you contribute to a political action committee. Because a contribution should be different from the effect of spending. Because we can see that this system of super PACs has wildly distorted what politicians pay attention to. They're constantly terrified that a super PAC is going to come in and support them or support their opponents. And so they bend and twist in order to make the super PACs happy. But the Citizens United speech is really a tiny drop in the bucket. There are very few corporations that in their own corporate name go out there and spend money um, supporting one side or the other because they found there's a high cost of free speech. Um, when Target supported an anti-gay governor in, I think it was Minnesota, um, they found themselves being picketed all across the country. So it turns out that the freedom that Citizens United announced that corporations and unions can spend unlimited amounts of money has not been the real thing Citizens United did. What it did was to encourage a lower court to say, if you can spend unlimited amounts, you can give unlimited amounts. And I would love to see that problem solved in whatever way it can, because I think that solution would be 90% of the problem. We have a couple of questions around proportional representation. Uh, like for example, Cambridge, Massachusetts has been using one for decades. Um, and you mentioned briefly about that when you're talking about ranked choice voting. So what's your thoughts and observations on how um, proportional representation might correct some of this? Well, I'm actually a supporter of an idea that fair, another idea that fair vote has pushed, um, which is that we, we district at, the, at Congress with multi-member districts in ranked choice voting determining who those members would be. And the advantage of that is it would take enormous pressure off of the line drawing problem of gerrymandering. Um, and so within any like five member district, um, as long as you can persuade, you know, a significant portion of the public to back you, you have a good shot of being a candidate from that district or a congressperson from that district. Um, and so that I think that, that um, that's a way to assure a broader range of views in the representation of, um, of, uh, of, the, uh, of Congress. And I think that that broader range would bring, um, you know, liberal Republicans, conservative Democrats that, um, that more accurately reflect the actual attitudes of most Americans. So I would love to see that, ex that added into Congress and um, at least see whether that's succeeding in uh, adding to the heft to the middle of Congress, where right now you see a Congress that is increasingly polarized to the extremes of both parties. Speaking of polarization, we have a couple of questions around that, uh, around the influence of media and how do we get past some of this polarization? Because some people do see media as part of the problem in pushing this. Yeah, this is an extremely hard problem. And again, the book, They Don't Represent Us, one part of that is they as in the government doesn't represent us. And the other part of that is they as in we don't represent us. And that what I mean by that is the we who's been constructed by modern media doesn't represent we as Americans in a sensible or proper way. And that's because the business model of media, whether it's cable, television, or internet platforms is to turn us into crazy people. The business model is to put us into our tribal corners and to rile us up in our tribal corners so that we get more engaged and more passionate in our tribal view of the world um, and thereby sell more ads or engage in a way that reveals more information about us to make it easier to sell ads. So the reality is we have a business infrastructure of cable and the internet which is designed, not intended to, but designed to have the effect of ruining the democracy, making it worse for us in a democracy. And, um, you know, I try very hard in the book to demonstrate why that's true. And I point to what I think of as possible ways to pull us back from that. 
but I'll confess, this is the hardest problem for me. I think I could, you know, I think tomorrow we together could figure out exactly what to do with the government. Like, I think we could get a representative democracy pretty easily. It's pretty clear what we should do. But how we recreate or construct a media where we try to encourage people to find the truth or understand the truth rather than understand what our team believes is the truth is a really hard problem. Now, when the, my book came out, my book came out in November um, of last year, and we were just entering into the, um, into the uh, um, impeachment debate and, and impeachment. And I was not surprised, given what I had um, uh, written and studied, that um, you know, people were extremely polarized about the impeachment, even though, of course, to our side, the facts seem pretty overwhelming. Um, the other side didn't see those facts. But it didn't surprise me because impeachment's inherently political and that is a political division of the understanding of those facts is not, is, not to be, um, uh, is, not, is to be expected. But if you had said to me in November of 2019, imagine there's a global pandemic that threatens the lives of, you know, that kills 200,000 Americans. In that world, would you imagine this polarized tribal media constructing in America that can't even begin to understand the facts about that threat. I would have said no. I would have said there's a limit. <laughs> like at some point we get beyond the games played by um, uh, this kind of media, but I would have been wrong. I mean, the astonishing fact to recognize is that we live in a world where we're still arguing about the most basic things about this pandemic. You know, on the one hand, one side saying it's outrageous to have had a shutdown, and then also saying it's outrageous to wear masks or to have to be forced to wear masks. Um, uh, one side completely not able to see the incredible failure of our response relative to, to other people in the world. And, and the fact that, you know, it's not controversial that we have been terrible relative to comparable nations like Germany or France or even Britain. But there's no understanding of it. There's no universal understanding of it. And that terrifies me. Because if we can't even come to a common understanding about facts as critical as these, how are we going to come to a common understanding about more political facts or facts that are not as clear or as tangible like global warming? I mean, it's understandable global warming is something 20 years in the future for most people, at least. But the idea that we can't come to con consensus around a pandemic which has got to have affected all of us. I mean, I know two people who have died. I know five people who are sick. Um, you know, and I can't be unique in this. There are many people who are affected. And yet still we have this deep tribalism that keeps us in our corner. And that is deeply terrifying for the future of, of uh, a representative democracy. And we are almost out of time, and I apologize we didn't get to everybody's questions, but we would like you to just have a, some closing comments before we end for this evening. Well, so again, first I want to say thank you, not thank you directly. I mean, I would thank you directly for having me here, but thank you for what you've done. Um, thank you for what this group does. Thank you for who you inspire because what you've done. And I guess I would like to close by focusing you on the incredible abyss before us. I tried to talk you beyond the abyss. That was the point of my talk. But I do think we should spend a minute focusing on the abyss. Because the reality is we have a very fragile system for selecting the president. And it's not designed for people who are not gonna act in good faith. And what we know is gonna happen is that uh, um, on election night, there will be a either red mirage or the next day there'll be a blue shift, which means we know there will be an exaggerated view of the number of people supporting the president on election night. And the next day and the next week, we will have many new votes coming in that support, um, that support Joe Biden. And already, Steve Bannon last night on Car uh, Tucker Carlson was saying, what's gonna happen is the president is gonna win on November 3rd and then the Democrats are going to spend two weeks stealing the election away from them. And the strategy that they are clearly signaling is that they are going to try to create unrest as the count occurs to demonstrate that, um, that demonstrate the, um, the actual results when all the ballots are counted. 
Now, now we don't have a mechanism for dealing with this well, except to make it a, everybody aware of this dynamic so we can be in some sense prepared for it. So we need to speak not about election day, but election season or maybe at least election week. And we need to get people to understand that the commitment to counting all votes has got to be a fundamental constitutional commitment. And we have to make clear to everyone that if we don't, then the de instability that that's going to produce is, is literally terrifying. Um, and, and I think all of us have a role in this to keep the peace and keep it going. But um, I am so fearful that what's going to happen is um, our institutions are not capable of keeping us on the track. And what happens when that unravels is, is for anybody to say. So I, I think there's a lot of work for us to do to talk ourselves through this process into the Electoral College and uh, into, the, and into January 20th. And I'll just flag one question in closing that I would be, I, do, I genuinely don't understand. One of the reasons we have such a difficulty here is the short time between election and the time that uh, electors are supposed to vote. So you know the election's gonna be on November 3rd, electors are supposed to vote on December 15th. And that means between November 3rd and December 15th, all fights have gotta be resolved before a state gets to select a slate of electors. And it's conceivable that a, slate could send, a state could send two slates of electors. And then there's a whole question of what happens when the competing slates show up in Washington. But one of the simplest ways to lower the pressure would be to push the date that the electors vote to later in the year or maybe even early in January. The Congress has the power under the Constitution to do that. And Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio has proposed that we do that. He's proposed a bill in the Senate that says move the count date um, to the end of uh, December. I think it's maybe the first week in January. And I can't begin to understand, but the, but the Democrats have refused to take him up on this offer. Um, and the reasons are just not clear to me beyond the obvious one. Marco Rubio is a Republican and um, he is to be suspected. But I think that could be a real opportunity to give us breathing space to make it possible for us to come to a settled understanding of what actually happened on November 3rd without the pressure to call the election or to stop the count, which I know will occur given the sig clear signals that the Trump administration has signaled. So that's a lot to close. So let me go back to the thank you and um, the gratitude. And um, I hope I get a chance to come see you in person because I'm so eager to celebrate with you all the extraordinary work you've done. Thank you. And thank you, Larry. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. I know it's much late, uh, later on the East Coast. Linda, did you want to say something? I, I did. Um, I did. Of course, I want to thank Lawrence uh, for uh, for speaking with us in such a in, inspiring way. I want to mention we are a grassroots organization. Our goal is working for the will of the people to advance policies that work for the will of the people and not the power of money. And unfortunately, at this most critical time, our surviving and our flourishing really depends on you. We need funds to pay for our wonderful executive director. We need a new computer. We'd like to get uh, Cindy some help. And uh, she accomplishes an amazing amount in a short period of time with wonderful coalitions that she builds. But I, I just don't think that's sustainable, ultimately. She needs some help. So anything that you can do to help us uh, build the ship that we want to sail in, uh, build the democracy that we, we need, uh, join us uh, today, become a member, invite your friends, and make a donation. Um, any donations will be appreciated. We had a goal from this fundraising week of making 20000 $200 a la 2020 vision. I don't think we're uh, yet uh, near enough to that goal and I hope you will help us. Thank you. And I also want to hold up um, uh, Lawrence Lessig's book, They Don't Represent Us. Those of you that bought a ticket of $50 or more will be getting a copy of this. I have them in my office and we'll be mailing them out next week. 
read this. It's a great book. It's, it's wonderful. So Ken, did you have some final words you want to say to Larry before he leaves? Cause I know he's a big fan. Well, just amen to everything. And uh, sorry, I didn't get my second and third question answered, but uh, it's very wonderful to hear your insights. You always bring up something new. And uh, so I would recommend anybody that hasn't read your book or others of your books to, to do that and to follow you on TED Talks and, and other things. You'll learn a lot from this man. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And Ken, thank I, will, I will happily answer every question you send me, I promise. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Larry. Bye-bye, everyone.